So our second speaker is also on the topic of games. We have four speakers and this is number two. So I'm happy you uh, stuck around uh, uh, to experience more interesting information on this topic. Um, well, sometimes job titles these days can be really cool. You can be a chief happiness officer or you can be a growth hacker, a ninja. You see a lot of that out there. And if you really master a topic in tech, you can be an evangelist. So. Our next speaker, Mark Overmars, is currently technology evangelist at his uh, the game company Ghoul Games. And uh, he's also been a professor in computer science here in Utrecht, the Utrecht University. Uh, but he's actually, and, and JP just mentioned it also in his talk, he's most well known for Game Maker, which is a really easy uh, to use tool to make games. And this is used worldwide by hobbyists, but also professional game developers. So that's really exciting. So I'm really happy to have him here. Uh, he's going to talk about uh, his experience in creating a successful game company and having a tool like that really helped him. So they were able to make like two new games a month with a team of just 10 people by having a tool like that. So I'm really interested to hear about that. Welcome to the stage, Mark. Thank you. About this job title, actually, I didn't have a job title. And then I was asked to give this presentation. I had to fill in the job title. So I decided, let's make up something that sounds nice. <laughs> and the company actually even agreed with it. So that, that was a good thing. OK, uh, it's great to be here to give, give a presentation here. Um, what I'll do in this talk, I'll primarily describe what we have been doing in our company, Tingly Games, how we ran that company, how we set it up, what lessons we got from that. And I hope I convey that to you and, uh, and, and it will help you. Actually, you'll see that quite a number of the things I'll mention relate a lot to the things JP was saying before, uh, but probably a bit more from our perspective in the way we did in our company with a bit more uh, examples. Um, so let me say a little bit more about, oh wait, this is of course the wrong button to press. I have to do this one now. Say a little bit more what I am, how I got in this crazy situation as running a game company. Because as JP said, you had to be young to start a game company. I was pretty old when I started my game company. I guess I was the oldest guy in the Netherlands that ever started a game company. Um, so, so I had a bit of a weird, weird uh, history there. So I started off working at Utrecht University. Um, that was my, 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 my prime work up till like three, four years ago. I did a lot of research there, started off with very theoretical work on algorithms, went towards other fields, doing more graphics, towards more robotics, and in the end really got into the game development part, the game technology part. Actually, my prime research area was crowd simulation. If you go to the stand of Utrecht, that's somewhere over there, you actually see the work done by my followers at, the com at, at Utrecht University, where they have some very nice demos of how you can simulate huge crowds of people and on one hand you can use that in, in games but on the other hand they use that for things like evacuation plans and and stuff like that for, for companies so it's really interesting to look at so that was was one part of me it's actually hard because now i cannot really see what's on my next slide um there's nothing on my next slide <laughs> there we are okay so the second thing that I did, and that's something probably people know me a lot more about, is, I can do this as well, huh? is Game Maker. Uh, Game Maker is, is, who here has heard of Game Maker? Good, who has worked with Game Maker? Great. Um, so Game Maker has a weird history, and probably good to say a little bit about it. I started this in about the year 2000, slightly before that. And actually I did that because I wanted my children to actually learn a bit how to program in a nice way. So I wrote this program basically for them. And it's no secret that actually my kids never used it because they really didn't like it. Um, but it, it became a hobby thing and it started being used by more and more people around the world and people were, it was growing and growing and at some moment people were making donations and things. And about five years later, I had a sudden feeling like, gee, I'm running a company. Uh, and I realized that, oh, I was having a company, I was getting money, I was paying bills, but I never registered my company. I wasn't pay paying any VAT or anything. I wasn't doing any of the things that I was supposed to do when running a company. 
So I really very quickly then had to start this all up in a formal way. I did follow the advice, make a good legal foundation, even though I was the only owner. So there wasn't much chance of a fight with somebody else. But, but still, I, I decided to set it up in a careful way. Then a couple of years later, it became bigger and bigger. So basically, Yo-Yo Games, a British company, took over, but I was still an owner of Yo-Yo Games, and I was still involved a lot in that. And actually, last year, Yo-Yo Games was bought up by a company called Playtech, who is running the whole thing now. And actually, since that moment, I have nothing to do with it anymore. So I'm not responsible anymore for anything that, that's happening with it at the moment. So I take credit for all the good stuff, but not, not for the bad stuff <laughs> since then. So actually, which many people don't know, GameMaker is the most used to the game development tool in the world. Probably the most used game development tool in the world at all. Uh, everybody thinks that that's Unity, but actually it's not. Only it's a quite different audience that uses GameMaker in general. But uh, JP already mentioned Vlambeer. There are quite a lot of big companies, well-known companies, many indie companies, but also non-indie companies that use GameMaker and produce titles that bring in millions of dollars. So it's definitely something that, that's used a lot in that market as well. But for me, that part is sort of gone at the moment. So... Next thing is that I really sort of started becoming a game entrepreneur. It started with my game maker company, which became Yo-Yo Games. I got involved in a company called Clever, which is doing applied gaming, serious games here in Utrecht. I founded Tingly Games, that I'll talk a lot, lot more about. Tingly Games is now part of Google Games, that I'm one of the owners of because of this meme. So I've been involved in, in game companies in many ways. I've been involved as a developer. I've been involved as an investor. I've been involved as a manager, as an advisor, so I've seen all the different roles. So I think I can, can tell you quite a lot of things. And if you have further questions after this talk, please feel free to come to me and I, I can, can try to pass that information on to you. It's really hard to work with two systems at the same moment. Because I now have to change that one, but to see it on that one, I have to change that one as well. Okay, so what's Tingly Games? Or maybe I should say what was Tingly Games, because actually... Tingly Games doesn't exist anymore since three months. So it was a company founded in about three and a half years ago by Art Bonewald and me. Art Bonewald was a well-known studio head, had worked actually also at Davi Lex as a start, uh, but worked also with a lot of casual games companies, worked at uh, a bigger companies, Playlogic, things like that. And so he was very experienced in running a game studio. Uh, and I came in more from, from the tech side. He was, he was much more the, the creative director type, but all also the manager type. And I was more the tech type, but in some sense also the manager type, because I, I ran a whole department at the university at some moment. And our focus was to do casual games. And actually, over the past three years, we did some 40 casual games. Uh, not the most original types. We really looked at what does our audience want and what are the types that are popular, but then try to be the best. As JP said, we are not the first in these type of games, but we try to be better than the ones that were around. From the first moment on, we concentrated on HTML5 technology. We wanted everything to run on the web, web-based games, game portals, but also mobile game portals, and HTML5 was just the technology for that. Um, and our sort of way of selling these games is that we didn't sell them ourselves to the players. We actually sold them to game portals all over the world. So strangely enough, we were actually a business-to-business -business company. Our clients were not the players, but our clients were actually the companies that ran the portals, which actually requires a quite different business model than if, if you sell immediately to the players. And three months ago, we merged with Booster Media into a company that's now called Cool Games. So we're now about 50 people. So we're definitely one of the bigger companies, uh, game companies in the Netherlands. Okay, so... A few things I learned from this, and, and I want to pass on to you. The first thing is that realize a game company does not make one game. Many people that start a game company are going to make this game. That's the game they want to make, and that's what they fully focus on. But if you want to make a sustainable game company, you're going to create a series of games. And actually, most of the time, your first game won't be successful, and your second game won't be successful. And if you're a company like Rovio, only game 50 actually becomes successful, but then a huge success. So don't give up if your first few games are not successful. It will happen at some moment. So keep in mind that you're making multiple games. And that actually means a different mindset for people. Uh, many game companies, I see small game companies, see every game project as a completely separate thing. They start from scratch 
throw away everything they did before, and now they're going to build this game and program everything from scratch. We said, and I really would encourage everybody that don't do that, first of all, pick your genre and pick your audience. Don't first make a racing game and then make something completely different and make a game for women and the next one a game for boys and first time you make a game for Steam and the next time you make a game for virtual reality or whatever. Um, try to stick to something and become an expert in that and understand the audience, understand the genre, know how this all works. Pick your technology and become an expert in your technology. Um, create your network and networks are different depending on the type of games you build. Uh, Find your early adopters, find your press contacts, find your uh, publishing contacts. Like Flambeer, that was already mentioned by APA, one of the things they did great is actually their whole network building. That's in the end what gave, I mean, they made great games, but they were a big success because of the network they created. Um, build your brand, I've always important as a company, and build your staff, as JP already uh, carefully said. And all of that, in some sense, you do to reduce risk. Because if you do all this, then, I mean, you reduce the risk because you can reuse things that you learned with your first game and so on. So at Tingly Games, we said we do casual games primarily focused on women. Uh, we use HTML5 as technology, but we create our own tools for it. Um, we set up extensive contacts with game portals. You have to realize game portals are like the App Store. They get hundreds of games submitted per day. So you have to set up your contacts to get them to publish them. Um, we created logos, websites, stuff like that. And we hired, on one hand, very experienced people, but we also combined that with some high potentials because we also wanted to give, give young people a, a chance to work on this. So let me say a little bit more about technology. Think about the tool you pick. Um, think about the platforms the tool supports and, and, and the platforms you want to support with your game. Uh, think about whether it's appropriate for the genre and the style of game you're going to make. And uh, think about whether you actually have the expertise or can build up the expertise to use that tool. I see many, many people nowadays in the game industry automatically go for Unity. And I have nothing against Unity. I mean, we had actually from Yo-Yo Games, we had very good contacts with the people from Unity. But Unity is not the best tool for everything. I mean, if you're going to do a 2D game that you want to publish on the web, forget Unity. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's not going to work. Um, in, in general, if you want to go 2D games, think a lot whether you want to use Unity, because it's actually the footprint of your games get large. Uh, they normally use up a huge amount of energy, so on mobile devices, actually, they're pretty en energy hungry, and so think about whether that's really what you want to do there. So think about, about your tools and how you, how you want to use them. After you pick your tool, think about a technology tool chain. Um, in the end, initially you might have to invest in tools, but in the end it will save you a lot of money. Think about whether you should do a level editor for your game or a more generic level editor for the series of games you want to do. Think about things like, do I need localization tools because I want to translate my games into other languages? Uh, do I want tools that help the artist create user interfaces for our games? Stuff like that. Some are integrated in systems like Unity, others are not and you have to think about that. Problem with that is it requires investment. Because, I mean, you're actually building stuff that not immediately bring you your first game. And for some people, they really are so much focused on this game that they forget to do that. But it's actually important. So how did we do that at Tingly Games? Well, uh, the problem was HTML5 didn't have any good engines. Oh, sorry, I should suppress this one as well. Thing. So, so we created our own game engine from the bottom up. Um, we created our own development tool. Of course, I had done Game Maker before. We sort of created a new Game Maker, but then dedicated to what we wanted in our company. Um, we created a generic game framework. We said if we're going to do many games, all games have a title screen. Many games have a level select screen. All games have screens like the game is over. They have high score screens. They have so many different things that are actually common in all those games. Let's build this all in a generic way, such that whenever we do a new game, we say, oh, we already have our whole level selection screen. Of course, in a way that we can change all the graphics, we can change the audio, we can change a lot of stuff in there, but in basic, all the code was there. So as a result, we got a scheme, like I said, on here on the, on the left. We had an engine that all our games used. We had a framework that all our games used. 
actually when you publish games on different portals, you have specifics for the portals. We made them in a generic way. So this whole part, we wrote only once. And then on top of that, we only wrote the parts that were specific for the game. And we did the graphics that were specific for the game. And then on top of that again, we had tools to do level design automatically. We had tools to do translations automatically, such that actually publishing a game in Chinese was like, well, we had to send some text to a translating agency, but it was like one minute and it was in the game. And that, again, increased the reach of our games considerably, obviously, to do that. So, so we invested in that, but as a result, after we had done all this, we could produce really a game in two to three weeks. So, so we did like two games a month and, and we're at, at the peak of the company speed that we're doing it. Which is important because many of these games bring in like maybe 10,000 euros or 20,000 if you're lucky. So you better do two a month as a company, otherwise you're never going to make it financially. Okay, JP already talked about team. And I want to stress that again. If you want a team, you need all the things JP mentioned. Design expertise, programming expertise, art expertise. I actually added marketing, sales, PR expertise, and the business financial expertise. And in our company, we did that. We had actually one and a half game designer, which is a lot, but actually design is, is, is very important for these games. Three and a half programmers. We had three artists. We had a full-time sales guy who went through all the portals to sell our stuff. And we had a sort of manager that was mainly half me and half art. Actually, the manager part was in some sense not, not the strongest in the company, but with our experience, we, we did, did manage that part as well. And it, it's really crucial to run your company. Okay, another thing I wanna tell you, and it's I think this a very important part is, whenever you start a game or a game company, you make assumptions. And you have to be aware that you're making assumptions. For example, you assume that this game genre people will like, or that this visual style you're going to use for your game, your audience is actually going to like that style. Um, and you assume that your the, the press will love your game, or that the publishers will like your game. Um, you assume that your level design will be appropriate for the target audience, not too hard and not too easy. You assume that your technology is actually capable of creating your game and that you can do that all within time and within budget. So these are all assumptions you make when you create a game. And this is true for any company, but with games it's actually even worse because games are very risky undertakings. Uh, the chance that your assumptions are wrong is very big. And you have to be aware of this. And what's extremely important is that very early on in your game project, you start verifying those assumptions. And many people do not. They spend half a year on creating a game or a year, and then they publish it and they hope people will like it. And that's stupid, to be honest. <coughs> you can verify many of your assumptions. Like, to verify a visual style, you don't have to make a game. You can make a little movie and send it out, or you can make some some drawings and, and, and show it to people. And there are websites that can actually help you where you can, people just compare things and you can say, okay, this or that is, I like this more or I like that more and things like that. Um, you can verify your technology by doing some first, some prototypes in the technology and see whether they can do it um, and, and so on and so on. So, so verify things and adapt what you're doing based on the outcome. If it turns out that people don't like your visual style, change it early on in your game. I mean, that, that, that way the chance of success is a lot harder. And if it really doesn't work, if you make your changes and it doesn't get where you want it, stop and do something else. It's very hard for people, but you have to make what's sometimes called a pivot in your company. You have to start changing the game you make, changing the way you do things, changing your technology. Do a big step, but do it early on because then you waste as little money as possible. Uh, and I really want to point people out to this book if you haven't seen it before. Uh, it's a great book to read. It's extremely relevant if you're working in the game industry because this is all about this whole process. The whole process of do small steps, verify assumptions, learn, everything you do is to learn and change your plan and make pivots whenever necessary. Um, it describes greatly how even big companies like Dropbox and things like that use this type of approach 
Um, and actually, because of that, they could become a successful company. So, so I really recommend you to read this book. I, in general, you see a trend in, in, in the whole gaming world is what's called data-driven game design, where people more and more make the whole game design, the whole level design, everything based on data that they gather on, on, on small test groups of users. And I really recommend that you do that. Test very early on with small groups, with take the right groups, but, but, but small groups, and ver verify all your assumptions and all the things you're doing. Okay, um, a company needs money. And of course, if you're young and you're just a student, uh, that sounds like maybe not the most important thing, but at some moment it will become important. And unfortunately, I've seen many, many companies fail because they sort of ran out of money pretty soon. Or what you see quite a lot of companies do is they m do things like things that uh, orders they get from other, other companies, they make something for other companies, and then they say, oh, and then the rest of the time we're going to do our own project that we really want to do. And in the end, this own project never gets finished because they get stuck in doing this, this work for hire for others. So think about funding. <coughs> now, if you talk about funding, clearly your first funding is your own time and your own money that you spend uh, put in it. And unfortunately, you'll have to do that. Um, nowadays, a lot of people talk about crowdfunding as a possible way of doing it. But that's for only very few startups that'll work. I mean, crowdfunding basically only works if you have a great network. So you should first really work on your network before you can do anything related to crowdfunding. Of course, there are always exceptions, but in general, don't trust that crowdfunding is going to work. Chances are very small. In the past, there was always the possibility to get funding from your publisher. So people would go with demos to all sorts of big shows, you show them to all sorts of publishers and then hope they would fund the rest of the game. Unfortunately, <coughs> again, <coughs> sorry, except for exceptions, this doesn't work this way anymore. Publishers sometimes are willing to tell you they will publish the game if it's ready, but they normally don't uh, pay for the development anymore nowadays, so you have to do it yourself. And then of course you can think about the real funding. Um, I've talked to quite a lot of, as you know, I've been an investor in, in some companies. I've talked to quite a lot of game companies, and one of the things I notice in most game companies is that if they look for funding, they look for project funding. They say, oh, I want to make this game. Can you fund the production of this game? I can tell you hardly any investor would ever do that. <coughs> they might invest in your company because they like you, they think the people are great, but they won't invest in this particular project. Now, of course, if they invest in your company, you lose part of your shares in your company, so you might not want that. <coughs> Sorry. But it's, it's probably the only way to actually get that type of funding. <coughs> Sorry. There is some water here. So, um, let me give some final, final remarks here. And it's, it's actually funny that JP said exactly the same. Take your company seriously. I mean, this is not a joke or a fun thing. You're actually creating a company that you hope you can work in for a long time and that will actually pay the bills at some moment. So create a business plan. Well, I already, the business model canvas was already mentioned that it's great, most of you already know that. Do it, do market research, know your competition, know what the chances are, really look into those things. And as I said, think about funding of your company also for the long term. Because if you don't do that at some moment, pretty soon, you will get into trouble. Really work on your network. The fact that you're all here already means you actually take that part seriously. Uh, but you have to build a network nowadays. There are so many games created. If you don't know the right people, if people don't know you, then it, it will be very hard for your game to get any visibility. So, so work on your network in many ways. And very importantly, if you start your company, don't think your first game will be a success. What you're doing is actually you're learning. Initially, anything you're doing in your company is learn. Learn how to make games, learn how to use the technology, learn what will work, what does not work. Learn how to reach out and stuff like that. So really, anything you do the first part of your company, think about, did I learn anything from this? Because as long as you learn, you're actually probably on the right track. And then at some moment, probably the success will come anyway. Okay, that was all. Thank you for your attention.
Where's the mic? I have hidden. Thank you very much. Um, one question about that trying and failing, and, and maybe even the 50th will be the success one. Are there any first signs that a game is actually picked up? So you're at your 30 gazillion try, and is there <coughs> anything you can look out for? <laughs> that, hey, this is, this is going in the right direction. Well, I mean, part of the things you see nowadays that, that many companies do actually trials. They take one company, quite often Canada or Australia, there they bring out the game, they pay money actually for user acquisitions in that area, they measure a lot on what's happening there, and, and, and then you actually know that, okay, how many of these people play the game, how long do they play the game, are they willing to pay, uh, what's the retention, all that type of stuff, and once you know that in an area, you can probably be pretty sure that they'll work in the, in the bigger world as well, and then you can figure out, is it actually worth investing in this game further? Uh, but some things like visual styles and stuff like that, you, you can do much, much earlier. Um, uh, so you don't have to build a complete game for that to, to verify that type of stuff. But in the end, yeah, I mean, luck is an important factor and will <laughs> stay an important factor in this thing. Kay. Are there any questions from the room? Yes. Is the mic on for questions? Tech guy in the back. <laughs> yep. Okay. <laughs> Hi. Um, actually, how does it come that uh, Tingly... Um, yeah, managed to mo uh, merge with uh, Booster Media. What was the decision for it? W were there benefits? Why we wanted to do it? Yeah, um, the benefits. Well, we, we had this philosophy in Tingly Games, we do what we are good at. And what we are good at is creating, designing and creating games. So even though we had a full-time sales director that was doing the contacts with, 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 with the portals and things like that, um, we our philosophy is we do the making of the game, we sell them, those people actually do the contact with the players. It turned out that that was harder than we thought, even though we I still believe it's the best way to do it, because you can do what you're really good at. The people that own the portals actually thought differently about this. They had more this feeling like, we want to control everything. And Booster Media actually control has many portals, and, uh, and because of that, they can also test games much better and can learn much better these things. So we decided that was one of the reasons it would be better to combine those two things. The other part is we wanted to go to more mid-core games. So we started off with more small games. We wanted to go to more mid-core games. Because, because of that, you need a bigger studio. And actually, by merging the two studios, we also had suddenly a much bigger studio that we could build these bigger games with. OK, I also have a small other question. Does the Tingly Game Builder uh, example that you showed, does it live on? Uh, yeah, yeah we're using it now in, in the new company, oh, okay. and we're, we're extending it there. Unfortunately, we're most certainly, for a long time, not going to make it public in any type of way. No, no, this was not really <coughs> a question, but it's an experiment, <laughs> right? yes, experiment yes. for Actually, you guys also. Yes, because you could have asked the question also the other way around. <laughs> why did Booster Media want to merge with us? And a large part of that was the technology, actually, that we brought in. Okay, that's answered my questions. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> any other questions from the audience? Yeah, you over there. Cool, thanks. Um, so I'm actually in between academia and game studio now. So what was your reason to leave academia to start a game company? And actually a game company in these kind of games? Hmm. Ah, that's a hard one. Uh, especially because I have to answer it in a polite way to everyone. Ah. <laughs> um, why did I leave academia? Um, well, I've been there for 30 years. Um, and I had sort of seen it all. I've been in, in all positions, in, in, in all functions there, and I decided that, again, I had sort of reached my sort of boundary in, in what I could still learn and what challenges it would pose to me. So I decided I need a new challenge, and it was a bit of a coincidence. Art actually came with the idea of forming a company. We talked it over. I first thought maybe I should just be an investor in there, but then I really liked him, and I liked the idea and things, and I said, well, I want to do it really from the ground up. So I decided new challenge, new thing to do. So I, that, that was sort of the way. And even though I said it was a bit weird to do it when you're much older on the other end, I mean, with kids that have left the house and, and mortgage being paid off, it was a bit easier to do it. I'm sort of on the, on the path down again on your expenses. Cool, <laughs> thanks. Sounds like a good choice. <laughs> Any other questions from the audience? Can I see fingers? No. Well, then you're uh, you're around. Oh, I'm not sure what mic is on. This one is. Um, you're probably around for answering more questions, yes, so, I'll be uh, so you uh, can find him. 
Um, the Arnett Peters was cancelled, unfortunately, so we're not talking about esports, but we are talking about drop stop. Uh, so we have one speaker on that topic. We'll switch over mics for a sec, and if PowerPoint doesn't crash, we'll probably be uh, back uh, in a sec. So thank you very much. You're welcome. And uh, we'll be back in a minute.